Hey friends, have you ever looked at your phone screen and thought, man, I wish my battery bar wasn't so dummy thick right now? Well, wish no more friends, because today's video is sponsored by the Black Hole Battery Drainer. With a Black Hole Battery Drainer, you can turn your precious handheld device into a useless lump of plastic in no time, leaving you angry, confused, and completely dissatisfied. Okay, okay, okay. Today's video is not sponsored by the Black Hole Battery Drainer. In fact, the Black Hole Battery Drainer doesn't even exist. Instead, I'm partnering up with something way better. Raid Shadow Legends. If you didn't know, Raid Shadow Legends just celebrated its three-year anniversary. And for the three mobile nerds who actually play it, it was huge. They gave out free gifts, released a bunch of new content, and right now, they've got a ton of special events and tournaments going on, so there really has never been a better time to get started. If you click the link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $40. It includes three free champions, plus a whole load of booster items to get you started in the game. But the offer is only available for the next 30 days, so you better act fast so you don't miss out. Yeah, I know, Raid Shadow Legends is like a meme of itself by this point, but it really is one of the most popular mobile games out there right now. Hence why I'm all on board. So, if you find yourself wanting to just give in and try it sometime, click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen and experience the cutting edge of mobile gaming that is Raid Shadow Legends. I have another pizza delivery story. I know there's a lot of these, but this one is different. I deliver for a higher-end pizza place owned by an actual Italian family. At this time, I've been working there for about three weeks. Most of the time, I can barely understand them. Even the register was in broken English. One day, I noticed a sticker in bad English saying, No ask for change for this number. What? JPEG? I asked the owner, Luigi, what it means, and... He tells me that my buddy, the other driver on Saturday nights, got into a fight with this old dude after he asked if the customer would like change back. I think that this is odd and continue. By some chance my bud comes back seriously weirded out explaining what happened. Dude, he loves teddy bears. This guy, he lost his mind, he's like fascinated with teddy bears. I'm so confused after he tells me this. At the time, the sun is still up and the next driver comes in to replace my friend. He had to leave to get home for something so he didn't fully explain what happened. The sun goes down and I'm sitting in the empty store. Slow business. Phone rings and I dash to the register because I need the tip money. The other driver is lazy anyway. I look at the caller ID. It's the same number from the sticker. To my surprise, the caller sounds perfectly normal. Nice older man with a sweet voice tells me his order, and everything's normal. Three large cheese pizzas, one pepperoni, and he tells me his bed bunk doesn't like the planes. I arrive at his place, and something is really weird. Those construction lamps for when houses are being built line up the lawn, aiming the lights down on a row of something. It's so bright I can't even see what it is. I get out of my car and walk closer. It's a row of teddy bears buried in the mulch. I'm starting to chatter my teeth. It's absolutely pitch black out here besides these lights. I look up to see an old Tudor style house. Top window I see an old man peering down at me. Honestly, I got in my car after this and took a breath. I go on X a lot, so this really bothered me. I get back out of the car and look at the row of bears. Notice that all of their scalps are taken off exposing the cotton stuff. Magic markers fill the tops of their heads, and I'm so confused now, and more confused than scared. I man up and approach the door. The second my foot touches the step, he opens the door. He bounces his arms off of his body over and over, doesn't make any eye contact, then bounces elbows off his body and comes out in the shape of a V. I laugh nervously and tell him the price while handing over the pizza. He continues to look around, everywhere except my eyes and just won't acknowledge me. I kind of just lay it on the floor for a second and look down. 
Immediately when I look up, he's sprinting full speed back into the house, down the hallway, and there's a teddy bear. It had to be on fishing wire or something because it was swinging. It swung across the frame of the hallway down to where he ran off to. I hear a crushing screech followed by something toppling over. No change, no change, no change, no change. This voice doesn't even sound like him, much deeper. I hear sprinting toward me and things falling. I sprint back to my car and turn to see him pressing a teddy bear against the window. I get back and tell the other driver what happened and he actually believes me. He proceeds to tell me that every driver deals with him but says, don't let him get your driver info. I realize he didn't ever pay so I take the hit and give my manager my stub. Fast forward to Sunday night, I get another call from the same number. I suppose it's normal since everyone has seen him so I take it. This time it is way too much food. Six pizzas. He sounds panicked and there are long extended words coming out. Hello? Yes, I'll have six, six pizzas, please, please, please. Reluctantly, I get to the dark house once again. This time there are no lamps. Teddy bears are different. The bears are buried head first in the ground with hot coals where the teddy's head would be. I genuinely can't believe what I'm seeing. He has them buried head first in a row filled with burning coals. I can see them glowing. Before I reach the door I hear something. Kind of sounds like one of those movies like Mama or Possession Things. I approach the door and notice a crude drawing of me. I start hearing footsteps on the road. Turn around to see a man completely naked, wearing a teddy bear mask with eye and lip holes, trying to get in my car. While trying to think of what even to do, the door flies open and another man comes running out. I think his eyes and lips were taped up. I'm not sure because I was so terrified at this point I didn't pay attention. He starts speaking in the same voice I heard earlier. Get in bed with Teddy. I'm in tears at this point with my heart racing. I run to my car and step on a hot coal. My shoes are thin, and I feel the hot rubber scalding my foot. The coal must have stuck to the melting rubber. The one man is running away from my car now, goes to the door, locks arms with the other man, and they both smile and wave goodbye. I push 60, racing back to the store. I don't even explain to the Italian family because the other driver's gone, and I quit and just head home. The next morning I noticed my driver's license was gone. I'm seriously flipping out because I know that he must have taken it. I decided to do more research on the Burry Teddy thing. It's a reference to Dante's Inferno when corrupt people would be buried head first in a tomb of fire with their feet exposed. The next night I'm with my friend in the living room and I start hearing footsteps on my porch. I open the door to peek and there's a mangled up teddy bear on my porch. I immediately report this to the police and they tell me that they'll set up a patrol in my neighborhood and should call when I hear something. The following Sunday I hear the steps again, call the police and stay inside. The police call me to tell me to stay inside and to not leave. The next morning I get the report and police cars are lining my street. A teddy bear was hung by a rope filled with actual human tissue. It was reportedly from an elderly man and police ask me all the details I know and tell them what I've been telling you. They report to the old man's house and the old man answers. He has no idea where his friend went, who's apparently missing, and I have a feeling that he does know. To this day, every few Sundays I receive a little bear. I live in New Jersey and you can check the police records. I haven't been able to find anything on their website, but I don't really care at this point. For this story I'm going to need to divulge into my high school life a bit. This is mainly to talk about David. David was one of those kids. Creepy, unkempt, and very awkward. But many hung out with him due to him always having the money to buy friendship. No one ever had anything good to say about him. Always smelled, never seemed to wash, and never seemed to be able to not make things awkward. Nothing too crazy at first, but 
around senior years when he became very unhinged. He had always been creepy when it came to personal space, walked way too close sometimes, accidentally touched either me or a friend of ours regardless of who we were. He always did it with an air of, if you say yes, we do it, if you say no, it's a joke. But now, he went out of his way to make it clear what his intentions were around us. At one point, he got punched by one of my friends when he accidentally touched her breast. At one time, he got full-on expelled for sneaking into the women's locker room and gave the excuse that he was too high to know where he was. No, really, that was his excuse. And once he got expelled, I only heard about him here and there. Nothing wild, but more like Bigfoot. It was like sightings and rumors. So let's just fast forward to the story at hand. Be me, working at a call center, get put in charge of a trainer's room. Think of it like teacher's aid, but for trainers to see who would be good to take a spot as a trainer once they or someone else leaves the position. The main thing I need to do is be like the hip fellow the trainees talk to since many who come in are usually straight out of high school and I was still 21 at the time. Nothing out of the usual, but we have people closer or older than I am this time around. They're all around nice people, chill enough to even go out and have a drink with, I suppose. But among them, I see a familiar face. The same fat, unkempt creeper I knew back in high school. Oh no. I try my best to conceal my identity. I was very fat back in high school, but over that time, I slash fitted up so it wasn't hard to conceal who I was with so much of the weight gone. Trainer then yells, Yo, Anon, can you help me out with this? Oh god. David's eyes immediately lock onto mine and he bolts towards me. I try to get away and pretend like I didn't see him, and luckily that was enough to get away. I think maybe he's just young, dumb, and full of hormones back in high school and he's changed. No. No less than a week goes by before one of my female trainees comes to me. Uh, Ana, um, can I talk to you in private? Sure, let's go to the room. And we sit there for a good five minutes in silence before... She finally tells me that another trainee has made her feel uncomfortable. Ah, great, I think. Uh, can I know who it is? David, she says. Said that earlier in the week she was sitting next to him when she asked if she could borrow a pen for some paperwork she needed to fill out. She continues by saying he not only took a pen out of his pocket whilst making lewd gestures, but as he gave her the pen he slightly rubbed his hand on hers. Tells me that she got very uncomfortable but didn't know who to talk to. I tell her that I'll speak to David and to leave it to me. The next day, I call David to a meeting and tell him to stop jacking around and that this isn't high school. If some stuff happens, it's on my and the trainer's head, and it can get him arrested. David just tries to say, she wanted it, man. She was so into it, I saw how she got. Ah, for Christ's sake. David, if you do this again... I'm going to have to not only write you up, but suspend you without pay. And he just says, lol, okay. I decide maybe that that's all he really needed and move on. The next couple of days, I get complaints from both the men and women in the class about how creepy he is. Tell them if you want him out to please make a report about this. The company has a policy where you can't complain on someone else's behalf no matter how much evidence you may have on the person. Over the next few days, everything from complaints about his smell to his dress to even his work ethic was sent to me. For example, he vomited on his jeans and came to work with the same jeans unwashed for a week. He smelled like urine for three days straight and got very close to people when they told him that fact. He kept slightly touching or poking people when they told him to stop multiple times. He full-on reached for someone's junk at some point. All these complaints and not one report from anyone. Fast forward two months into training and a trainee comes to me and says that she wants to file a complaint on him. The lady goes on to tell me that David followed her to her car that night before. He was asking her for a ride and she refused more than three times. Finally she got in her car and was about to go when she saw David put his backpack on her hood. He then proceeded to try and open her car door. Let me the F in. I want a ride home. I'll die without a ride home. He yelled along with other less than classy words, according to her. She finally just decided to drive off, but not before he hit her window and cracked it. Okay, this is where it ends, JPEG. But wait, there's more. 
As I'm writing the report to turn it into PR, another woman came in. Oh, hello, Anon, what can I do for you? She begins to cry her eyes out. Uh oh. Goes on to tell me how David had cornered her during the previous week's team meeting outside. Says he looked like a man possessed and looked up and down at her like he was just waiting. She got so scared she ran out of the room and just left. She did in fact leave early that day without a word until later that night where I got a text telling me that she had an extreme emergency and I just shrugged it off and let it go. She also wants to file a report and I say okay whilst I get the paperwork and she asks me, is he going to get fired? I tell her that since he now has a report to his name it's a very real possibility but just in case to keep your distance and tell me right away if anything happens. She leaves and I'm now stuck with having to write two reports for this guy and some way I'm relieved because it just means I won't have to deal with him much longer. I turn in the reports and notice David outside, thinking about talking to him and maybe, just maybe, making him understand how screwed up he really is. I decide to not and just walk off. All of a sudden I feel a hand on my shoulder and realize from just the smell it's David. Now what? turn to David and he is looking at me like he wanted to stab the first thing he saw. What did those people freaking tell you? Did they stalk me? Did they go behind my effing back? I didn't answer his question but I did tell him that he has to make sure to watch himself from now on unless he wants to be put on some sort of registry. A month passes and the brass doesn't deem it enough to fire this creep. I'm just as surprised as anyone and finally the faithful day comes. David's finest hour. Starts off normal, but for the past month we had David in a separate cubicle away from the class at the behest of our PR department. Finally lunchtime comes and of course my job is to keep a lookout for David. If anyone here has worked for the certain company I worked for, you know they run their company like they do the mob. Real shady and no one outside usually gets involved and people on the floor or in management get used for say unusual secondary tasks go about my lunch, having to make sure David doesn't leave my sight or go near anyone. Most of the team I was helping train felt bad and ate with me during that time, even though they knew they weren't supposed to. Anyways, get to about 3.30, almost time to let the trainees go home. All of a sudden, David comes up to me and looks me in the eye, like he tried telling me something with only his gaze. Uh, can I help you, sir? I need you to teach me something again, sir. Uh, okay, w what do you need help with? He takes me to his cubicle. I see him reach into his bag, and he takes out a list. It has written on it the names of people who have either filed a report or just generally complained about him. Uh, David, what is this? Just a list, sir. I just want to make sure they get what comes to them someday. What? You know, I have a gun or two not mine, but I can use them. David, you do know that what you're telling me can be taken as a threat. Well, so what? You're my friend. If I kill them, you can help me, right? Remember, I gave you a dollar in high school. I scratched your back. Now scratch mine. I decided that enough was enough and immediately went to the HR person. I tell her the stuff that happened and she tries to make every excuse as to why it may not have been so bad or why we can't just fire him. I tell her that besides me, two other people filed official reports and everyone has complained more than once about him. Finally, she gives way and says that she'll investigate it. I tell her if she wants to see it, then her best option would be to get him to show you his bag right now. She reluctantly decides to go and check his bag along with some security guards. David, knowing that he's screwed, tries to make up any excuse he can. Now they're all just bullying me. They're hating me because I'm gay. I have bipolar depression and need help. I I'm a virgin with rage. I'm not kidding. He really said this. Literally anything he can to try and get out of it. David, knowing he can't get out of this, snaps and lunges at the PR woman. He actually gets a few good hits in before the security guards and I pried him off of her. The whole thing makes enough of a scene to get people to look at what's going on. David continues to try and fight his way out of all of it and even takes a swing at me before the head trainer who was a former military sergeant comes and just chokes him out. 
We toss David outside and call the police. The PR lady files a report that he went and assaulted her. The police also found about three bags of cocaine in his bag. He was arrested on assault and possession charges, and he gets hauled off, hopefully, to never be seen again. After the dust settles, I finally decide to rest at my desk. As I was going back to my desk, I found another note that was from David. It said, If you're reading this, it's because I wanted to see your face last. I wanted you to be the final one I shot. I want to be the last thing you effing see, you traitor. I hate you, and I will kill you. I never heard if he's out or still in custody, but I won't lie when I say that I still look over my shoulders sometimes. I've had a lot of time in the security world and my favorite gig was an armed patrol security company I used to work for. We would primarily run security for Section 8 complexes. I was OIC of this in a major US city. The adrenaline rushes are addicting, so these Section 8 complexes get pretty ominous at night. The freedom of patrol is being able to respond to calls and really stretch your legs during a shift. If one area was calm, you could head out to an area that you needed to. Around 2 a.m., patrolling in a complex of multiple three to four story buildings, sometimes this place was so bad that we would roll gun in hand sometimes. Roll around to the rear of this building and notice one of the boards of a dilapidated building is ajar. We would clear these buildings for vagrants and other illegal activities. Get out of the patrol car and look around the area. It's dead quiet. Figure that I'll clear the building, something to do at least. Once I get inside, I look around. The regular once occupied dwellings have signs of previous life. I always wondered who lived inside, what decisions in their life led them here, and what exactly happened that caused their building to be taken over by gangs and them forcefully moved out. I would always find the odd legal letter here and there, the odd children's drawing of their family or the sun and flowers. Around the corner of one unit and I find something interesting. I find a hole. I figured I can get through there pretty easily and I'm curious about what's on the other side. I'm getting drywall all over myself, inhaling the good old asbestos, and I'm now a dog on the hunt. I find a series of holes, one leading to the next. This building is pretty big. Mind you, had to have been maybe 50 units inside. Honestly, I'm having fun in this ghetto labyrinth still going deeper into the abyss. You would find constant graffiti around. Sometimes it was a menu of services in the area, sometimes it was just a child screwing around. I figured I had to be getting closer to the end, shouldn't be that many units left. I would always stop and read what I came across. Sometimes it was intel, but I would always think of myself as a ghetto archaeologist of sorts and absorb everything I could. Finally reached the end of this whole journey. The end has a bigger room attached to a smaller one to the side. Clearly, this is the sin room. Find a bunch of smashed phones in one corner, trashed litter about. Signs of people that were in this room not too long ago. Then I started to find a lot of bullet casings around the area and made sure to document one. See, the last room I haven't looked into yet. Go into the last room and that's when I see it. The danger bone zone. I.e., I have found a mattress room. I make sure to take a pic when I realize I'm deep in a labyrinth that no one knows I'm in. Radio is out of signal range and I have no backup. I see a bunch of stuff in front of me. I think there's blood on the mattress. When I go in for a closer look, I hear a series of footsteps in front of me. Immediately know that I'm deep behind enemy lines and I need to get the F out of there. I'm not a cop. I don't really care what happened here. I need to get out of here. I book it out of the holes and get back to my car. I light a ciggy and hit the road to calm my nerves. This place had murders at least every month. It was honestly the worst I'd ever been to. It's been demolished now, but I find myself thinking about that ghetto maze from time to time and wondering what terrifying stories happened there. I have one to share. It's not spooky as much as unsettling, but be me, a 22-year-old security guard on their last shift. 
been working this job since I left the Air Force. Finally getting around to going to college, so I'm getting a new job in the campus library. I basically work as a gate guard for some snobby rich neighborhood. Place is honestly the worst. People scam literally everyone they can. 75% of my job is turning away pizza guys who were given bad checks or letting cops in to serve court orders. Last part of my shift, my replacement was supposed to be there at midnight, but now it's 30 after. Screw you, Kyle. Gray Nissan pulls up to my gate. God, dude, I just want to leave. And instantly something just felt off. A woman gets out, keeps ducking low or glaring when the occasional car passes us, just residents coming and going. I ask her if she's okay. She says that she's being followed by someone who just assaulted her. I immediately tense up and go into high alert, ask her if they're close and start looking for anyone or any cars loitering around. She claims the car that just passed us was the abuser, and before I can say anything, says that he's coming back. It's a totally different car, and she says another car is following her. Starting to realize she was on something, well, maybe you could call the police, ma'am. They're all in on it. And this is before I knew what gang stalking was, and this carries on for a while, as she keeps indicating car after car as a pursuer. She claims when they stop at a stop sign, that's them passing off their stalking duties to the next car. Finally, her boyfriend shows up. Dude walks out of the bushes on the neighborhood side, scares the life out of me. He starts trying to calm her down, gives me this slow, I already know, nod before I say anything. Eventually he's able to get her into her car and they drive away. Other guard shows up as my butthole begins to relax. I tell him about it and go home. The next day I get to work to find my boss and a sheriff waiting. They ask me about last night. I answer everything and show them the report I made of the thing. I found out that the boyfriend was stabbed multiple times and was currently in the ICU. The woman was still on the loose. I finish giving my statements turn in my uniform, shake my boss's hand, and go home, officially no longer my problem. I still think about it occasionally. No idea if that guy died or if they caught that girl, or even if she was on or off something. Like I said, nothing spooky like skinwalkers or anything, but just very unsettling. I truly believe that if we kept talking and I let her get closer, she probably would have eventually attacked me. So I guess I'm just lucky. I recently got a job at a mall and a tea shop. It's a really big mall in a really big city. It's in front of the children's playground area inside of the mall. I often have to close the store which takes a long time, washing teapots, etc. And we're usually the last set of workers out. We usually blast music so we can only really hear the music while we're cleaning. The first time leaving I kept hearing children's laughter resonating through the entire mall while I was lost trying to get to the parking lot on my first day of work. It was absolutely terrifying. It turns out the mall has implemented a subliminal tactics to subconsciously convince people and children that they're having fun. They program certain machines, those coin-operated cars, to emit children's laughter to give the ambience of fun and excitement. It's bizarre and scary and extremely strange because they don't turn the laughter off at night. Now, I was working at Joanne Fabrics there at the mall and a woman comes in, in her early 20s, very pretty young woman, healthy looking, very sweet. She can't decide which fabric to get to make the dress. I explain that they're both on sale. She makes no eye contact and laughs and says, Alright, you convince me. Maybe I have three yards of each, please. She spends a lot of time stroking the fabric, smiling, sort of whispering, How beautiful, and how lovely it is finishes by saying that she'll be very glad that she got both. She makes eye contact with me and smiles. I guess you're right. I've only got a few more days to live, so I've not much to lose. Thank you for your kindness. I'm stunned after she says this. She walks away as she's saying this. I can't say anything to her. Wouldn't have had anything to say anyways, I suppose. And I watch from the cutting counter as the other girl rings her up. Once she's done, she turns around and looks at me, smiles and waves, and walks out the door. 
never saw her again. Not really scary, but just rather bizarre. Her eyes just gave me the crazy chills. Darknet stories. If you weren't aware, should always be treated as jokes. True dark nets are not actual nets at all. Clients like Tor create a plausible deniability source. Perhaps you may have seen something on Tor, but if you can access Tor off of Google, then there's little chance that what you saw was real. Actual dark nets are kept well and truly hidden. They cannot be found or accessed by the average Google user or internet surfer in general. I know I'm coming off as pretentious, so let me give you an example. I've had, perhaps at most, five experiences with the darknet. Please understand that even with the credentials and skill, it really does involve a great amount of luck. A friend of mine works at a small car insurance broker's office and asked me to fix a problem with his computer. Something about it not recognizing the office scanner on the network. Details aren't necessary, it's just how I ended up in this position. I bring my laptop and immediately notice a wireless net with high signal strength. Out of curiosity, I turn on a sniffer to pick out the password while I work on a scanner. Maybe a few hours later, he and I get back from lunch and I begin to wrap up my work on a scanner when I remember the sniffer. Got the password of the mystery signal, connected, and began to poke around. Just a basic home network. One system online, internet access, no firewall, and apparently no antivirus. No, I'm not saying I'm a good person. I'm just a person who knows my way through a computer. So I drop in a back door before I leave, which pretty much just means that I have a little file that will allow me to snoop around their files. You never know what goods you can find. I get home and decide, hey, I have the night to myself. And I really start digging through the computer's files and come across your standard stuff. Nothing fancy aside from tax forms and maybe a few text files with what I assume were passwords. Random characters and random names, but nothing of interest. So I install a worm onto it and leave it be for future use. For those that don't know, a computer worm is a virus that spreads itself to other computers that are accessed by the original host. So if this computer connects to another computer, boom, I can then see that new computer's files as well. Remember to get your antiviruses, people. Weeks later, I'm arranging some proxies from some bots when I realized that there are additional bots that I hadn't set up myself. What I figured out later is that the owner of that mystery Wi-Fi signal, aka my friend's boss, had shared a file within that system which the worm happily infected and shared it to multiple other machines. This is where the interesting stuff begins. Two of those machines had internet access but apparently were never used to actually access the internet. Both ran Windows 98 and both were completely unpatched. Apparently only had internet access because they were physically networked with other machines that were used for internet access. Each machine had about 3 terabytes of storage, seemingly empty, but I found out that they were actually packed full with encrypted bytes. The encrypted stuff was easily viewable and contained huge amounts of deeply personal information. Information that could cost people their lives. I'm talking social security numbers, tax IDs, full names and addresses, lists of their family members and even some pets. And some oddly unique data too, like their vehicles, favorite clothing, their height and weight and recent medical bills. Granted not every byte listed all of this information, some of them just listed names, but what they all did display were dates, timestamps. Couldn't make too much sense of that, but what I could make sense of were the bank accounts. Thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of account numbers, institutions, and safety deposit boxes. All over the world. South Africa, Russia, Brazil, everywhere. Nothing but the basic ID information along with the timestamp. As I was picking through one of the two machines, I noticed a file being written live. I figured someone was using the computer at the moment, but... The only command events that were being registered were coming from my worm. Nobody was using a keyboard or a mouse. Figured it was an automated system process, so I sat and watched what it was doing. That's when I realized the computer was communicating on another network. A network protocol that I didn't recognize. 
because I knew when it started writing and when it stopped I was able to transcribe the entire file, about 78 megabytes. I assumed it was one file and not a chunk of something else and, well, I was right. Since it was one file, I had a few educated guesses about what a file that size could be, and my first guess was right. MPEG format. It was a movie. The title was just a random string, and the video itself was an overhead view of three men sitting at a table. In the entire 15 minutes of the video, only one of the men spoke. It sounded like gibberish, but I figured it was code, or he was just nuts, you never know. He said things like, broken banana stung red book. Then he would pause and say another strange sentence, and this kept going on for about 10 minutes. The other two just watched him. One was drinking what I assume was coffee. Finally, he leaned back and asked if they could leave his daughter alone. The guy drinking the coffee just shook his head quickly. The code talker started crying, like really crying, hard. He leaned forward and said another nonsense sentence, and the video ended. Timestamp was about 20 minutes before the video was uploaded to the machine I got it from. I had a really weird feeling about it, but my guess at the time was that it was a clip from some movie I hadn't seen and that it was just a streaming broadcast, with the timestamp on the file being the time that it was being sent. And then another began. I unencrypted it and started watching. Again, another string for a name and can't remember how long the video actually was. It started with the man from before, the one who spoke in code, standing over a table while the other two men were standing beside him smoking cigarettes. The first four seconds, I thought he was seizing and shaking, but the camera moved, and that's when I saw the corpse on the table. There was blood all over the man and the table. I won't tell you what was happening between the man and the corpse because I couldn't finish watching it. It was about a minute or so before reality sank in on what I just watched. I've seen a lot in my time. That was not a movie. I cleaned my traces from those systems and haven't looked back. Where do I even start this? I'm a filmmaker, sort of. Haven't made anything decent in a while and I studied in Ireland from where I grew up. So one day, I was out filming for B-roll in the countryside, quite a decent walk out of town. A guy, let's call him Jack, pulls up as I'm walking home and gives me a lift. Jack's a nice guy, in his 50s, fascinated by filmmaking and is interested to hear what I'm filming for. I think nothing of this conversation, just simple small town talk. Two years later, I've graduated with my film degree and I'm enjoying my grand journey of being unemployed. I'm out and about, shooting stuff for a mini project and who of all people pulls up beside me? Jack. He reminds me of who he is, says that it's such a strange universal sign that our paths cross again, and then informs me that he is part of a paranormal investigation group. Would you like to make a documentary about us? Is all he needed to say and I was on board. God, how I wish I was not on board. I start going to the group meetings, hiding my X power level the whole time, acting ignorant and dumb to everyone. I do learn a few interesting things, like, for example, turns out ghost hunters or paranormal investigators are just about as territorial as literal gangs. Such and such place is this group's turf. Back off, is something they would say. I also learn that no one actually fully agrees on what exactly ghosts are or how ghosts communicate, and that everyone is a different kind of eccentric, with their own special abilities that make them oh so unique. As for the actual group, it consisted of a French cougar that other female members disliked. Her name was Nikita. There was the head of the group, Ellen, who was a quote-unquote seasoned veteran of the paranormal. Another member, Jane, was some sort of pseudo-Wiccan, and also one of the sensitives of the group. Turns out, Jane's been doing rituals in the woods by my house for years. We begin doing investigations together, none of which actually displayed evidence, in fact, one of the pictures I had taken was of a literal scam. Wiccans would caretake this castle when it wasn't being used and would host one of their psychics to join the investigation, 
where she would then lead us and our equipment under a radio tower to make the meters go off the charts. Anyway, on to the main event. The Kunin Ghost House, and you can google this, it's quite literally some evil dead tier abandoned cottage in the middle of nowhere, right on the northern island border where a legit exorcism took place in the 1920s. Lots of other local legends surrounded, but all you need to know is that it's got some seriously dark history to it. I got a tip about it from a Northern Ireland friend, a possible ex-criminal. We'll call him Brian. He told me about it as soon as I mentioned I was in a ghost hunting group, and normally he's very jovial, but he said in a dead set tone that I needed to make sure I stopped by the local pub or call the local police station to tell them that they were going to occupy the place at night. The implication that he was getting at was that if we didn't tell anyone, some Irish Republican army gang would kill us for snooping around their territory. And while it sounds extreme, it is true. There are still all sorts of IRA gangs floating around on border towns, using different words to cash weapons, drugs, and whatever else. The woods around the Kunin ghost house were no different, so I relay this dire information to the group. Hey, pals, uh... Please, God, tell the locals that we'll be going there at night. And well, no surprise that this didn't happen. Oh well, we told Nikita to do it, but she was too busy trying to sleep with the guys at the bar. It's Nikita's fault. Oh well, Ellen was supposed to do it, but she was too busy with blah blah blah. And Jane was supposed to do it, but she was sick at the time, blah blah blah. And all of their excuses was just some weird last minute thing. Few people actually knew what was happening, even fewer knew of the lore, and all of a sudden, it's nighttime. We're driving up to a haunted exorcist village in a heavy extremist territory. Jack's driving us in his van but ends up coming across a large barricade, tries to drive around it, resets his GPS, and we literally come to the same barricade two more times before Jack realizes he wasn't changing his route, just turning on and off Google Maps. We're losing some valuable time, so once he solves the issue and finds a way around the barricade, he slams on the gas, and we're flying over every hill and hump. I'm white-knuckled at the time, holding on for dear life, afraid that we're going to crash just from trying to take videos of... ghosts. Finally, we arrived. We're three hours late, and it's just about to start raining. We park in a little clearing on a back road, cross over, and head down a path to the village. We stay for an hour, they do their thing, I take pictures and videos, and surprise, surprise, no ghost activity. We're tired, cold, wet, disappointed, and we just want to go home. And as we get to the path to our vehicle, two other vehicles suddenly pull up. By this time, it's about 1am on some back roads, and these aren't strangers. These are IRA members. They step out of their clown cars and I watch them literally put on this tough guy facade. Like they stepped out, took a deep breath and started walking with a weird posture. Cute, I thought. They couldn't be older than their teens that they were trying to just prove themselves as men, so the one goes on a tangent, acting like he was very surprised to see people in his territory. J just tell them that we're shooting a horror movie. They won't believe us if we say we're ghost hunters. I tell Jack. And Jack just immediately goes, Hello, we're ghost hunters. Sounding like he's said it with a dumb smile on his face too. And so at this point, I've accepted my fate. We're going to get shot in traffic by some dumb teenage gang members who are trying to coax us back to the house, saying that we're just looking for some scraps and could use some help. Jack actually almost goes with them too before I finally snap and yell, Just get in the car, cops are coming. Even when he did get back in Jack's van, he didn't immediately take off. We watched the kids scramble to their cars, taking a moment to stare us down before Jack finally has a flush of logic come over him, and we drive off. I asked him why he waited so long, to which he asked about not wanting to run from cops, to which I kindly informed him that it was a lie to get the kids to panic. He drops me off, I block their numbers, and never speak to them again. And there you have it. Don't go ghost hunting in gang territory because you might just be the one haunting the territory in the end.
I was at Fort Leonard Wood from 2010 to 2011. We did our training in those woods too. I often talked about drill sergeants and how they told us not to wander around at night, how we had to radio in for an escort in the bathrooms, etc. All the drill sergeants have live M4 carbines and we have beater M16A3s with blanks. I never told anyone the story about the odd things that happened to us on nightland navigation in those woods. Nightland navigation is when you walk around in the woods at night in full battle rattle or fully suited gear and look for certain pre-decided points that each have a code word. Different groups get different points so every group has their own phrase and that way you can't cheat. I get sent in a woods with my squad consisting of myself, my buddy Walters and this 30 something air force sergeant from a night nav course. The course starts right after sundown, and it's February, so that's around 7 to 8 p.m. maybe. It feels like we spend forever wandering through the woods until we get to our first point and begin hiking toward the second. Tell Walters to let me know when his pace beads hit three kilometers as we hike for a while. Sergeant Chair Force takes the map as everyone kind of zones out. At some point, we cross a stream, and I ask to see the map as it's only a mini-map with a few grid squares. And of course, there is no stream on the map. I ask Walters what his pace count was, and I'm met with a lovely, Oh god, I forgot I was supposed to be tracking. Great. We ended up reaching near a large hill, and began going up this deer trail along the hill. Suddenly, Sergeant Chair Force grabs me by the collar and pulls me backwards. I'm sleep deprived, hungry, and super stressed, so now I'm very mad and start to lose my cool. Before I can even begin to insult him, he makes a shushing motion, looks dead straight ahead, and points. A few meters in front of me, there is a tripwire going between two saplings on either side of the trail. He brushes away some dead leaves carefully and I hear him swear under his breath softly. There's an 81 millimeter mortar buried in the soft dirt. We circle in close and begin to have a quiet and intense discussion on A, what to do now, and B, where exactly were we? We decided to try and back our current location to where our first point was, and at this point, I asked how we missed our second point, as they were all marked by little chem lights. Well, turns out Sergeant Chair Force had been resting the compass on the butt plate of his M16, so now we are hyper aware that we are completely lost, and probably several clicks from anyone in our company. We have three more hours to the Nightland nav course before the drill sergeants will even begin to look for us. We decide that we should head in a direction roughly opposite to the booby-trapped hill, as we don't want to encounter another mortar and all die. We tell Waters to watch his pace count this time and we hike for about a kilometer. We end up coming to a misty clearing about 50 meters across with chest-high grass. We make it about halfway through the field when we suddenly hear something and we stop. As we stare through the mist, I watch as four non-humanoid figures rise out of the grass. We raise our useless blank-filled weapons, and at this point, I've come to terms with my own death. Suddenly, they begin yelling, Drop your weapons! Drop them now! We yell the same thing back, and also yell the challenge of the day, and we all realize that we were both military and both sides lower our weapons. They approach us and talk to us and ask us why we're in this area, what unit we're with, and who was our first line, etc. The reason they all look so non-human-like is because they're all wearing ghillie suits, face paint, and are armed with high-grade M4s with PEQ-15s with what look like thermal optics and suppressors. One of them goes off to make a radio call as the other three stay with us. They begin to make small talk about how they remember BASIC, and give us cigarettes because they remember Nick fiending. They also ask us if we've seen anything out of the ordinary and they won't judge us if it seems weird or stupid, and so we mention the IED that we actually almost just tripped on. They seem surprised about us saying this, and tell us to forget about it as they give us a pack of smokes and repeatedly remind us to forget about anything we saw out there. Suddenly, a convoy of two Humvees arrive, two sergeants in each, they make us drive on the way back while they ride in the turrets and passenger seats. Every once in a while, 
like on cycle, they tell us to keep our mouth shut about this. This IED incident is not mentioned by our sergeants or anyone involved for the rest of my military career. And so, that's the story of how I accidentally led my squad into a squad of special forces doing some real-world secret stuff with IEDs in the middle of the woods in Missouri. I don't know if I got the feeling across very well, but I feel like the special forces dudes were out looking for something, as they had live rounds and were setting gnarly booby traps. I used to know a 60-year-old ex-aviation engineer in Bozeman. He was a math professor before becoming a contractor for the government. Apparently he learned a ton about physics and material science from some of the other guys he worked with and helped with some calculations on some obscure hydrogen bomb. I don't know if he was always deranged, but I wouldn't be surprised if he lost his sense after working for the government. For example, he once rambled on about how he used to have a shape-shifting car he'd used to kidnap people in middle America. He'd go around, crash into someone's car, and kidnap them as his car would be untouched and he wouldn't leave a trace. And as he'd drive back to his home, he'd change the shape of his car numerous times. He also said once how he'd had a key that could unlock any door. He demonstrated on a couple of cars, but I just assumed it was a neat party trick. There was another instance where he ranted about different types of networking cables and how difficult it was to set up a surveillance system for his farm. Not for his animals, but instead so he could track human movement. Not too weird, I suppose, but he said that he would use it for his basement if he could figure it out. He owned about 40 acres and also owned a massive underground private bunker. The creepiest thing I remember about him is that he would always vehemently disagree about the existence of aliens. Even if you made a passive, off-handed comment, he would argue with you that there was nothing in the sky, nothing but humans. I lost touch with him after I left, but some of the stuff he used to say would get you thinking. He was probably a regular old kooky man, I suppose. I remember that he owned a number of clothes that was about twice the size of XXL, despite being very stout for his age. And if I recall correctly, one of his old friends had something like gigantism. And so he kept some of their favorite clothes, but I can't exactly remember what he said he did with the car. I want to say that it was stolen, but I really can't remember the details. Also, some small tidbit ramblings that he'd shared. He had a gun that had an infinite cartridge. It didn't use bullets, but instead he'd scoop up a load of dirt and it shot compressed dirt balls. He owned cyanide teeth with individual cyanide teeth within them. He even popped a pair of cyanide dentures into his mouth just to show me that they fit. He and another guy had come up with their own secret language, and it sounded like nothing like common languages I've heard before or since. He would occasionally even write in it. He claimed he was a Freemason and actually tried to get me to join but also told me how all they did all day was make small talk and plan donations to school, so I didn't take him up on his offer. Also, I described him as a regular old man because that's just how he came off to me, like an old man with a ton of wisdom and experience, but also a sense of humor and exaggeration to come up with crazy stories to justify his knowledge. Looking back, I do hope that he's doing well nowadays. A friend of mine was a marine and a former army guard. He'd tell us interesting stories, things he'd seen in Iraq, with crazy plots and whatnot. But one day he pulled me aside as we were out for drinks and he just blurted out asking me if I believe in ghosts. Now, he's a very manly man and I could tell he was embarrassed to ask me this, probably not wanting to be ridiculed for getting scared. I tell him of course and he lightens up with me almost instantly as he begins to tell me of his one experience. In 2005, he was on his battalion commander's tactical team as a squad leader, and because of this, was usually excused from guard duty. However, there was a night where he couldn't get out of duty for some reason or another, and this is where it all began. He goes to post one night, but his other guard doesn't show up. One of the two guards, who we'll just call Joe, that my friend was relieving from their shift, 
I decided to stay until the new guard showed up. But not too much later, a soldier that neither my friend nor Joe recognized had walked up and relieved Joe of the shift. My friend begins trying to make conversation with the new soldier, but he seems quiet and to himself, grunting occasionally. Finally, my friend starts feeling the pull of the night and can't stop yawning. The soldier looks over and goes, Go ahead, man. I'll keep watch. It's the least I can do. My friend's like, Thanks, bro, and the soldier replies, No problem, man. I know what it's like to be tired. And so my friend goes to sleep. Morning comes, and the new relief starts kicking the life out of him for, one, being asleep on shift, and two, for being by himself. Obviously, this means my friend was in deep trouble. He begins explaining his story to his commander, to his XO and whatever NCO would listen. Turns out, the original guard never shows up. Some random soldier relieves Joe and then relieves him. They all ask the name of the soldier and he tells them. He said every single one of them appeared almost disgusted with him and every single one of them asked him if this was some sick joke, as that soldier had died in combat months prior. He then tells them all to talk to Joe about it as proof and Joe tells them the exact story, detail for detail. Soldier that Joe doesn't know appears, relieves him and assumes the post with my friend. My friend still got punished but not as crucified as he would have. After this experience the rest of the tour had several accounts of meeting this random soldier. He never did tell me the soldier's name but he said that multiple guards encountered a soldier walking up to relieve them but nobody took up his offer. The role became to just tell the ghost of the soldier that his watch was done and that he can go ahead and rest. Eventually, he stopped showing up, and perhaps he finally got the rest that he deserved. When I was five years old, my parents moved into an old brick house. I don't know the history behind it, but for some reason it intrigued them. It had a weird layout to it with big rooms and a large bathroom, but only one bedroom. The bedroom was perhaps the largest room in the entire house, so my parents and I shared it together. After a couple of months, weird stuff began happening to us. I would start having nightmares every single night, consisting of me being taken away into darkness. When having these nightmares, I would apparently begin sleepwalking, with my parents finding me asleep in the kitchen or on the bathroom floor. But then, my parents began acting... off. There were times that I would wake up in the middle of the night and one of them would be standing up beside my bed looking directly over top of me. Not talking, not moving, just staring at me. Even when I'd wake up, they wouldn't move so I'd ask them what was wrong, to which they'd just say, nothing, go back to sleep, and then go to sleep themselves. As I grew up, I began having what I can only refer to as blackouts. Basically, everything would turn black to me like I was unconscious, and then I'd wake up an hour or so later. But whenever I'd ask my parents if I fell asleep, they looked at me confused and talked about how I was just running down the hall like 10 minutes ago or was just talking to them a few minutes ago. One morning, I had a blackout, and according to my mother, I yelled out, I should tie the curtain rope around my neck and jump off the sofa. A minute later... She's running through the house and gets to the living room to see my body hanging from a rope as I was gasping for air. I don't recall any other blackouts happening to that level of severity. But even after all these occurrences, we continued to live there for at least another two years without any issues. Does anyone have any idea what happened? This story was told me from my mother's perspective. Back in 1989, years before I was born, my parents were living together in an apartment. At night, my father always slept on the wall side of the bed because my mother liked to use the lamp to read until she fell asleep. Several times a month, she would be woken up by my father's anxious movements at night, where he would pull her face tightly into his chest and cover her with his arms. He would look wide awake when she looked at his face, but he would be silent and would not respond to her. Every morning following a night like this, she would find him already awake, sitting in bed. 
She would then see that he would always swap places with her on the bed while she slept, and then would wait for her to wake up before leaving the bed. Or if he was out of bed, he would be sitting somewhere near the front door, sipping coffee with his revolver tucked in his waistband. He would tell her that things were okay, so she assumed it was him having night terrors or sleepwalking without questioning. Eventually, my father left home to join the army, leaving my mother alone in the apartment. My mother started hearing the floorboards of the hallway outside of the bedroom creaking while she's up late at night reading, and whenever she would check the front door, it was always double locked and chained just as she left it. Later on, she had a phone call with my father and she brought up the noises. My father tells her that he's not surprised and explains what he heard and saw those nights. He told her that he was hoping that he was just losing it, but continued to explain. He was a light sleeper and said that after the creaking woke him up at night, he would look up at the bedroom doorway, which had no door and about one out of every five chance, he would see a very tall silhouette wearing what looked like a long overcoat and a Humburg hat standing in the hallway, facing him. The dark figure would stay for some time and then silently shuffle into the hallway. My father told her he never slept on those nights that he saw or heard anything, and he was in the process of installing a bedroom door before he had to leave. My mother refused to stay up late in that apartment until they eventually moved out. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, to get in bead with Teddy.